is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, my name is Kelly Tebow, and I'm with the New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders. I will be your organizer for this evening and would like to welcome you to our webinar on understanding and dealing with children who refuse or avoid going to school, a cognitive behavioral approach. Thank you all for joining us. Before I have my colleague introduce the speaker for, the, for tonight, I'm going to cover some housekeeping items with you. All participants are muted. If you have a question, please type it in the bottom of your question box and click send. You may click, send, click yeah, you may send questions during the webinar. However, we will have Dr. Flansbaum answer the questions at the end of his presentation. We will get to as many queries as time allows. And in addition to tonight's presenter, will be available to take your questions on the Wednesday webinar blog, which is accessed from our homepage under the heading programs. This blog will be monitored for the next seven days. Feel free to look and post questions as often as you like. Answers will be archived for future reference. If you missed part of the presentation or would like to watch it again, an archive version will be posted to our website shortly. We value your input, and in order to expand the webinar experience in the future, we need everyone to fill the survey out as you exit the webinar. NJ Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders, its directors and employees assume no responsibility for the accuracy, completeness, objectivity, or usefulness of the information presented, nor do we endorse any recommendation or opinion made by any member or physician. We do not advocate for any treatment. You are responsible for your own medical decisions. Now I'm going to turn over the introduction of our speaker to Martha Butterfield, the webinar coordinator of NJCTS. Marty? Thanks, Kelly. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's 19-2020 school year. And we thought it would be an appropriate time to cover the topic of school refusal. Before I introduce tonight's presenter, I would like to remind all of you Jersey folks joining us tonight that we will be at the NJEA convention in Atlantic City, booth 1209, on November 7 and 8. If you're attending, please stop by our booth and say hello. Additionally, we will pre be presenting a workshop on Tourette Syndrome at 11 a.m. on Friday, November 8. For those of you in the education field, the workshop would be well worth your time. Now, to, with a specialization in cognitive behavior therapy for children and families, he completed his internship in child and adolescent psychology at the New York University Child Study Center. Additionally, he provided clinical services and received specialized training at several prestigious programs, such as the Child Adolescent OCD, TIC, TRIC, and Anxiety Group at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, the Tourette Syndrome Program at Rutgers University, and the Institute for ADHD and Disruptive Behavior at the NYU Child Study Center. Dr. Flansbaum is a clinical psychologist and director of the Center for Cognitive Behavior Therapy in East Brunswick, New Jersey. He provides therapy, school-based consultation services, and professional development workshops focusing on the evaluation and treatment of children and adolescents with a variety of social, emotional, and behavioral difficulties. Additionally, he has specialized in the assessment and treatment of Tourette syndrome, trichotillomania, which is hair pulling, skin picking, as well as OCD, ADHD, and a range of anxiety disorders. He also has a specific interest in school phobia and parent training. In addition to his clinical practice, he is clinical assistant professor and coordinator of cognitive behavior therapy training for the Child Psychiatry Fellows in the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in New Brunswick. Dr. Flansbaum, welcome to our Wednesday, Wednesday webinar programming, and I'm pleased to turn tonight's presentation over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Marty and Kelly, uh, especially for that warm introduction. Um, I'm honored to be able to present today 
uh, for NJCTS, uh, an organization that I've uh, had the opportunity to follow and found to be a wonderful organization with passionate staff uh, and a really important mission. Uh, I'm grateful again for the opportunity and thank you all for joining uh, for my talk tonight. We're going to talk today about school attendance and how to get kids to go to school, um, formally understanding and dealing with children who avoid school, a cognitive behavioral approach. Uh, while we're not uh, specifically talking about Tourette's syndrome today, um, I am, uh, you know, I certainly welcome some questions in particular about it at the end if people do, uh, if people do have any. Um, I'm sorry, I'm doing a webinar for the first time, which I'm very excited about. Kelly, is there a screen thing on my screen? I don't know if you're able to see it. Oh, here we go. I apologize about that. Um, so just to give a brief overview uh, today, what I'd like to talk about uh, is um, a little introduction to school refusal behavior. We'll talk a bit about how to understand, how to think about children who uh, refuse or have great difficulty attending going to school. And then we'll get into some strategies. We'll talk a bit about in, in addressing anxiety-based school refusal. And then we'll cover some general accommodations uh, that can be useful for, for schools to consider. And I'm hoping at the end that I have the opportunity to take some of your questions. Uh, if we don't get to your questions, uh, Kelly mentioned that there's going to be a blog at the end. You're welcome to reach out to me that way. Uh, my email address, um, you know, is also a good way. You're welcome to, to reach me with any questions there um, as well. What is going on with my, scr with my screen here? There we go. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, is uh, not a particular patient, uh, but a hybrid of a number of patients uh, that I've seen over the years. Uh, John is an 11 year old boy and he has some difficult mornings. He complains of stomach pain uh, in the morning. He's often getting into arguments with his parents about going to school. He says he really doesn't wanna go. He doesn't feel like it. Uh, when John does go to school, uh, he's anxious about failing. He tends to feel really uncomfortable around others. Um, and so his heart starts to beat very quickly, uh, but the fears are there, silly or embarrassing himself. Um, as a result of not being in school, though, John has come to fall behind in his work, and he's very worried about how he's ever going to catch up. Uh, John really does want to go to school. He just can't seem to uh, to get himself there on a regular basis. Um, there are a lot of things that we could say about, about John from a diagnostic perspective. Um, you know, this case was deliberately, deliberately vague, uh, but one of the areas that stands out for John would be a problem that's often referred to as school refusal. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what school refusal is. Uh, to begin, I would say that school refusal is a, uh, is a condition or is a really a term uh, that I believe is pretty poorly named, um, but nonetheless well defined. So let's talk about a couple of characteristics of it. Uh, when people talk about school refusal, uh, they are referring to child motivated absenteeism from school. In other words, children who for some reason, and we'll talk more about that, that notion of motivation later, for some reason are not going to school. Uh, they may be chronically tardy uh, or leaving school early. In other words, uh, it's, in other words they, they, they may make it to school even if they're considered school refusers, um, but they're often late, they go home early. Uh, sometimes before they go to school, they have a significant tantrum or a lot of complaining or conflict at home. Other times, children who have school refusal do actually make it to school, uh, but when they are in school, they exhibit extreme distress. Uh, the reason I refer to school refusal as being poorly named, uh, but nonetheless well-defined, is because while I think the criteria above are pretty clear, uh, there's something about the term school refusal that I don't, that I don't love. Uh, it has a connotation, perhaps, to some that a child is choosing not to go to school. And in reality, that's not always the case. Uh, somebody, someone with school refusal may be making a voluntary choice to stay home, but other times his, 
his his decision may be more uh, involuntary, or perhaps one could call it semi-voluntary, in the sense that he is uh, not going to school, but because of the fact that he or she may be anxious or really uncomfortable uh, when at school. School refusal is an umbrella term for chronic absenteeism. In other words, uh, school refusal is not a formal diagnosis. Um, oftentimes, though, uh, children may have some other diagnosis uh, that uh, goes along or comes along with school refusal. Uh, in other words, absenteeism is really only the tip of the iceberg. Um, according to this particular research that I cited here, uh, about a quarter, about a third of kids with school refusal behavior don't meet criteria for a diagnosis. Um, and then a, a good chunk of them have separation anxiety disorder, particularly the youngest kids. Uh, some of them are diagnosed with a generalized disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, or GAD, and uh, others have ODD, major depression, specific phobia, or other uh, conditions. Uh, in my clinical experience, at different points in time, uh, my practice has had uh, pretty significant numbers of children who are uh, avoiding or refusing to go to school. I would say that I rarely see children who don't have a co-occurring diagnosis. Uh, in other words, in my experience, um, children tend to have a co-occurring disorder. I would say the vast majority of the time, um, that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist otherwise. Uh, you know, the research studies are based on large sample sizes, um, but just from a clinical perspective, I often do see a good chunk of kids, um, and they seem to often be having these co-occurring conditions. Um, so why do we want to go about treating school refusal? Uh, school refusal has important, important consequences, both in the short term as well as in the long term. In the short term with school refusal, uh, as many people, especially those uh, you know, professionals and parents on here who have uh, children or students with this condition, uh, they tend to have poor academic performance, uh, impaired social development, and oftentimes um, you know, depression and suicide ideation. Uh, the logic behind these short-term consequences is that when children are not going to school, um, they're often going to begin to struggle with academic performance. Uh, social development is often a set of skills that is shaped from being in school and from interacting with uh, same-age peers. And when you're consistently not in school, uh, you don't have the opportunity to practice those social skills, and then they often become underdeveloped. Uh, when children are very isolated, uh, from not going to school, that in many cases can trigger, uh, you know, depressive episodes and even, unfortunately, suicide ideation. This is the reason that, that uh, you know, that addressing school refusal uh, promptly becomes so important. Uh, the short-term consequences kick in. Uh, additionally, some long-term consequences when uh, children refuse to go to school and then often don't make it back, uh, is they're at greater risk down the road for engaging in criminal behavior. They often have greater interpersonal difficulties, marital problems, social isolation, difficulty with maintaining jobs, and a higher occurrence of psychiatric problems. So what are we going to do about children with school refusal behavior? The first step is always going to be a comprehensive assessment. Uh, this is important for most psychiatric conditions, most medical conditions, and particularly important with school refusal because there are a lot of different components that can come into play. So when I'm working with children with school refusal, I recommend uh, a, uh, a, a multi-factor, uh, you know, a multi-component uh, multi multi-component assessment. I often speak to parents about how I view addressing school refusal as putting together the pieces of a puzzle. And so I'm going to have a child component of my assessment, a parent component of my assessment, very critical as well as a school component of the assessment. And if children do have a history uh, of any psychiatric difficulties, I will want to speak with their psychiatrist. Uh, and oftentimes I touch base with the pediatricians as well, just because they have a long history oftentimes or several year history of knowing the, uh, of knowing the patients. So in terms of the clinical interview, um, what I often find to be beneficial in these situations is to really try to connect with the student and understand some of the student's interesting goals. So whether you're a psychologist doing this evaluation or whether you are uh, school personnel, um, it's really important to try to get into the child's world a little bit. 
Uh, sometimes people consider understanding the student's interests, talking about the student's goals as being part of rapport building or just kind of getting to know the child. Uh, there is some merit in that, but I think that it is also a really important component of trying to do effective treatment. Uh, when we understand the student's interests, we often can come up with better metaphors to be able to relate what we're doing in treatment to the students to the student to, in order to build motivation. Uh, similarly, when we understand what the child's goals are, particularly something like career goals, uh, that can be really helpful. And I wouldn't be turned off by the notion of, oh, my child is nine years old, he doesn't have career goals. Uh, he may not or she may not have really thought out goals, um, but just having a sense of, you know, the child wants to grow up and be a teacher like mommy or daddy or grandma, or the child wants to be able to, uh, child be able to build cars one day or to, um, you know, make video games. Those are nonetheless little nuggets that we can use in order to be able to help connect, help bridge where the child is at with not going to school and how the child would benefit from going to school. And additionally, in terms of uh, the clinical interview with the child, uh, we wanted to get a good sense of what are the different uh, uh, different psychological, psychiatric symptoms that might be going on. Uh, particularly uh, among children who refuse to go to school, there's a high co-occurrence like we talked about earlier with anxiety disorders and with depression. Uh, we also do want to be on the lookout for suicide ideation thoughts about death. Um, it's not something to be paranoid about. It's not something, I know that's a clinical word, it's not something to be overly concerned about. Um, you know, it's not very common, uh, but certainly it's something that we want to be vigilant about in our assessment um, in case we need to change the course of treatment to address that, as that would obviously be the most pressing concern uh, were that to be the case. That's in terms of the child. Uh, understanding the home environment is very important for addressing school refusal because parents are a really important part of the treatment process, whether we're talking about a little kid or an adolescent. Uh, or even adolescent, you know, whether we're in elementary, middle, or high school. So in terms of the home environment, uh, understanding the parent's attitude about school refusal, how they view the child's not going to school, uh, understanding the parent's discipline style. Uh, some families are uh, very heavy on love. Uh, they're also very heavy on limits uh, in discipline. Other families are very heavy on love and light on the limits, uh, and others, tend to limit both of them. Uh, you know, they don't have enough positive attention that they're giving their children, and they also don't have enough limits. Um, understanding these factors, you know, where parents kind of fall on the scale from being kind of overprotective, leaving their child, thinking their child is independent, uh, is really important because parents are gonna be given strategies to be able to assist the child with making steps towards returning to school. And of course, understanding the stressors that are in the environment can be really critical as well. Um, you know, if there are limited uh, resources at home, if parents are working multiple jobs, if there's only one parent or grandparent home who's taking care of the child. Uh, and another thing to keep in mind in terms of the home environment is sometimes when children go, don't go to school, there is a legitimate stressor that's going on. So occasionally what happens is, uh, Children may not be going to school because mommy or daddy or grandma or caretaker is sick. Uh, and that's an important component. Uh, while certainly we would encourage the child to go to school, and that may be a treatment goal nonetheless, uh, we would want to have proper sensitivity regarding that. Um, we also want to make sure that we incorporate the school's view of the challenging behaviors. Uh, getting information about what actually happens when the child is at school uh, and the needs that the child seems to have at school, where is the child successful, where is the child not successful, uh, those are all critical components. Uh, one of the cool parts about the, the webinar is, uh, before I presented here, I got some stats uh, from NJCTS about um, you know, who is actually attending this webinar. Uh, and it seems that we have a nice mix of school-based professionals, uh, mental health clinicians, um, parents of children you know, who exhibit school refusal uh, and, and some others. Uh, so I will try over the course of our strategies to, to hit avenues uh, of intervention that could be helpful for all of you in each of those, in each of those different settings. Uh, just quickly in terms of assessment, I know this will probably be more relevant for, for folks who are uh, school, pro school professionals, mental health professionals, 
Um, there are a couple of questionnaires that are listed here. I would encourage you to uh, incorporate them into your assessment. Uh, the school refusal assessment scale we'll talk about in a moment in terms of what it does. Um, the uh, SCARED is an anxiety, uh, anxiety screening measure. Uh, it's available free. Uh, you can just Google for it. Uh, the child depression inventory is a, uh, is a measure that can be purchased. Um, questionnaires are really not a way of making a diagnosis, uh, but they are a way of gathering information. They are a piece to the puzzle. That school refusal assessment questionnaire is designed to help us with getting to the root of the problem. And ultimately, when we are effectively addressing students who are exhibiting school refusal behavior, we have to figure out a way to get to the root of the problem. Um, the root of the problem when it comes to school refusal uh, tends to be uh, one of two areas. Uh, either it's an access function or an avoidance function. And let me explain what I mean. When we're referring to the access function, uh, we're referring to students are not going to school in order to gain certain things at home. The avoidance function refers to Students are not going to school in order to avoid certain things, situations at school. So for example, uh, students may not go to school because they are fearful. They are avoiding certain objects or people. Maybe it's the alarms, the playgrounds, the buses, teachers. The, the locker time is a common one. The noise in the hallways. Students may also be avoiding certain anxiety-provoking situations, uh, performance situations, taking tests, having to give presentations, uh, being worried that the teacher is going to call on them and they are going to uh, make a silly remark or everybody is going to laugh at them if they, they say the wrong answer. So children refuse to go to school in order to avoid um, these objects or people or performance situations. Other children are not per se avoiding school, but they're staying home from school because of what they gain. Uh, sometimes it's the case of some type of tangible reward. Um, you know, they get to sleep late, they get to hang out and watch television. Um, you know, maybe they have other friends who are not going to school and they are, uh, they are talking with them. They are, uh, you know, drinking or, or, or using drugs or vaping or some other, some other uh, reinforcing activity for them. Uh, sometimes it's not that tangible thing that they're gaining, uh, but sometimes it's the attention that they're gaining. Uh, and attention can come in different forms. I often talk, when I talk about behavior management, either teaching parents or presenting at school workshops, uh, I talk about the idea of behavior, man I talk about the idea of attention as having three levels. Uh, first prize is positive attention. Positive attention, as we know, is gaining attention for engaging in appropriate behavior. Um, the second prize, though, is negative attention. Uh, negative attention is gaining attention, gaining attention for problematic behavior. Uh, the notion here is kind of like the expression of some children would rather be wanted for murder than not wanted at all. At least somebody is paying attention to them. And so this is why even when children are having tantrums at home and parents are tending to them and trying to calm them down, that can actually be maintaining school avoidant behavior. Because even though as parents we're saying to ourselves, gee, there's no way that he wants me yelling at him. There's no way he wants me telling him it's almost time to get to the bus. Uh, nonetheless, we are giving them attention, which is perhaps better than no attention. And then third prize would be no attention at all. So we have positive attention, attention for negative behavior, and finally no attention at all. So understanding the root of why children are uh, not going to school, whether it's the access function or the avoidance function, is really the key to trying to figure out how we're going to effectively and efficiently do, uh, facilitate treatment. Uh, we definitely can just ask a few questions with our assessment and say go and start with strategies. Um, I find that it is really important to spend a good amount of time doing a thorough assessment. Um, I really, you know, I often share with families that I'm working with that, uh, you know, I, I may spend a little bit more time on the assessment than others, um, but I think that it is well worth it because while we can start right away with strategies, it would be really frustrating to just pick up a couple strategies based on our quick assessment. And then when nothing is working, then we have to go back and figure out another strategy to do and try that one only to find out it didn't work. It didn't work because it was a poor strategy, but it simply didn't work because of the fact that 
we weren't targeting the right function or the right motive. We didn't properly understand why the child wasn't going to school. And for that reason, we weren't able to, to address the uh, school refusal behavior. So why don't children go to school? Um, we talked about those reasons uh, just a moment ago. For the younger folks, they tend to be avoiding the objects or people that evoke anxiety for them. They tend to stay home in order to receive attention from parents or caretakers. The adolescents tend to be avoiding the social or other evaluative situations at school, or they stay home in order to gain access to those tangible rewards. They want to sleep late, hang out with their friends, watch TV or play video games. So let's talk a little bit about anxiety-based school refusal. Uh, with the treatment of school refusal, the most important component is to understand why kids keep avoiding school, not just the origin or when it first happened. Uh, the key to understanding school refusal, in other words, is we need to be understanding what is maintaining the school refusal behavior. Why does the child continue to not go to school? Uh, I talk about this, uh, the, this with uh, older kids. I often use analogies for it, um, going back to interests. Um, so oftentimes I'll relate it to a roller coaster. Sometimes I'll relate it to, you know, having a dog and feeding a dog. Um, but the analogy, I think, helps make it stick. Um, with uh, younger children, I often still try to uh, explain this model to them um, because when children understand why they are not going to school, um, you know, and kind of make sense of their own thoughts and feelings, um, then when they have to go ahead and undergo treatment and actually face their fear and go to school, in other words, to be brave, uh, we can be more effective in doing so because the children recognize that my short-term discomfort is ultimately for long-term benefit. So let's run through this uh, chart quickly here. Um, what you have on the, on the top, you have anxious thoughts and anxious feelings. So what happens is, let's say there's a situation here um, where, uh, you know, the child is, you know, he wakes up, at, he wakes up in the morning, he has the best of intentions and he says, mommy, I'm going to school today. Daddy, I'm going to school today. Grandma, I'm going to school today. He's got these anxious thoughts and he's thinking to himself though, all of a sudden, as soon as he starts, pops out of bed, starts putting on his clothes and then he goes to himself, oh my gosh, I'm so behind on my work. I'm never going to catch up. Um, he starts thinking, his racing thoughts kick in. Um, and then he starts to feel really uncomfortable. He starts to feel a little dizzy. His heart's racing. Now he's having these anxious feelings. So what does he do in order to make himself feel better? Well, if he can somehow avoid going to school, then in the short run, what he's done is he has escaped from the behavior that's making him, un he has escaped from the situation that's making him uncomfortable and he feels better. He has calmness at home. You can think about this as if you're going on a roller coaster. Uh, usually kids like this one because kids like roller coasters and oftentimes parents don't like roller coasters anymore. Um, it's the equivalent of when your child is trying to get you going on a roller coaster and you get in line, you know, one of those real long lines that they have at Disney World or Six Flags. And as you get closer and closer to the front of the line, you start to be thinking to yourself, this really isn't going to go well. You, you know, the stunt, you know, the butterflies kick in. And when you make that decision to get out of line, how do you feel in that moment? In that moment, you're going to feel better. You're going to feel better because you have just escaped from the uncomfortable situation. But of course, just like with that, just like, you know, in that roller coaster situation, what you've done is you haven't really gotten online. I mean, you haven't really gotten on the roller coaster. And so when you get back online to try again, you're going to once again continue to be scared. The same is true when it comes to anxiety and school avoidant behavior. The child is thinking, I'm not going to do well in my work and therefore he's anxious and he's dizzy, um, he avoids by deciding, you know what, I'm not going to go to school, I'm just going to stay home, here I'll be much calmer. In that moment, he's feeling better. But in the long run, what's happening is the next day he wakes up, now he's not only behind on his work, but he's another, not from the previous days, but now he's even an additional day behind. And so now he will continue to be anxious. So, in essence, what happens with our treatment in terms of the principles here 
is we are going to teach children that even though they are uncomfortable with the idea of going to school, they need to cut out the avoidant behaviors. Even though we are anxious, our heart is racing, we're feeling really dizzy, our head, it, you, know, our, um, you know, our body is a little bit shaky, our faces are flushed, what we're going to do is instead of avoiding, we're actually going to approach. We're going to face the fear. It's the equivalent of when you're getting more and more nervous as you're getting closer and closer to the roller coaster, being able to tell yourself, I'm going to do this, and then actually getting on. And so what happens, of course, when you get on the roller coaster? Well, if I were to ask you, which uh, I can't totally do here, but you can think about, which would be more scary to get on the roller coaster you know, the first time or to go on a roller coaster for the 50th time? The first time you go on the roller coaster, it would be really uncomfortable. But by the 50th time of going on the roller coaster, you may not love roller coasters, but you're probably not going to be petrified anymore because essentially what you've done is you've gotten used to it. And in formal and psychology jargon, we call that habituation. Um, and so what happens is at first when you are scared, you are avoiding. And what we are going to try to help children do is to gradually work their way back to school, taking small steps. You know, and as they take those smaller steps, they become braver and braver and braver. They are slowly going to get used to, hey, I can do this uncomfortable situation. I can face this fear. And that's how they're going to be able to ultimately return to school. So that's the conceptual model. The conceptual model is we have a cycle of avoidance and we have this process called habituation, presumably, you know, which plays, which plays a role in helping children, you know, eventually return to school. Uh, this isn't the only way of thinking about it, by the way. There is some, some new research to suggest that there are other models besides habituation that are at play. Um, you know, but certainly for working with children, uh, I think explaining this idea to them, uh, broken down into parts for younger children, the bottom line here is the more you do it, the easier it gets. Uh, you know, understand, helping children and adolescents understand that concept can be really helpful. So let's move into the strategies. Um, so in terms of strategies for parents, for teachers, for counselors, uh, the three E's are what I keep in mind here, to externalize, empathize, and encourage. These are broad strategies which are not to be underestimated, even though we're going to get into some specific ones in a few minutes. When it comes to externalization, what we're doing with externalization is we're separating the child from his behavior. We're trying to kind of create some distance. Uh, how do we do this? Um, with younger children, I'll often talk to them about naming their anxiety. Uh, you know, often we'll call it the worry monster or the worry bully. Uh, we can have children talk about the worry bully. Uh, with older children, uh, I sometimes use that same analogy to be quite candid with you. Uh, but oftentimes what I do is I just talk about the idea that you and your anxiety are kind of like two separate entities that are, you know, that are at war with each other. Um, and so what we do by separating the child from this anxious behavior is it helps to avoid uh, seemingly blaming the child. Uh, Johnny, it seems like it's really hard for you to go to school today. Your anxiety is really being very overpowering. Um, that's a lot different than Johnny, stop, you know, stop fussing around and get to school. You know, it's Johnny, your anxiety was just too strong today. You know, it won today. Um, so it one is kind of creating that distance. Um, so when we can when we can label our anxiety, um, you know, and we can label the thoughts, the feelings, the triggers, um, you know, this helps children to be able to build awareness. This is part of empathizing. So what does it mean to empathize? We want to listen to the children. When children are telling you, when students are telling you, I can't do this, don't just say yes, you can, um, but acknowledge. Uh, this is really challenging for you. Your anxiety is really strong. Uh, it's very hard to be able to do this. I know you'd rather be home playing your video games. It would be much easier and even more fun if you and daddy got to hang out today. Um, we can acknowledge the realities for kids. Um, we are still, uh, but we also want to, um, you also want to encourage them to be taking steps forward. Um, so we need to be cheerleaders. We need to provide labeled praise. La labeled praise is behavior-specific praise for the steps forward children are taking towards returning to school. 
Uh, mostly, uh, I incorporate language such as being brave and facing your fears and doing the thing you're afraid of. We want to problem solve with the child. We want to encourage the child to be able to uh, think about what's a step that I can take here. If going all day to school is too hard, what would be another step I can take? Um, you know, what would be something I can do? I'm going to school today. It's really hard to raise my hand, though. What is it that I can do in order to be able to uh, help me raise my hand? What is it that I can tell myself? Um, problem solve and help children to be able to identify coping strategies. What's most important, uh, or what's equally important, is we want to make sure that we're not being overly reassuring or enabling school avoidance. In other words, sometimes what happens here is we have very well-intentioned parents and educators, and we don't like to see children in distress. That's completely understandable. But sometimes what comes natural as a parent, what comes natural as a teacher is not necessarily in the child's best interest. And one of those cases is when we let our children off the hook and we allow them to stay home or not continue to face their fears. So what are the types of interventions we're going to, uh, we're going to be using? At the beginning, we start out with education, uh, talking about that cycle of anxiety or avoidance of school that I spoke about earlier. Uh, another analogy that I often use is one of a false alarm. Um, a false alarm is the notion that uh, I'm thinking uh, bad things are going to happen. I am feeling bad things are going to happen. Uh, I'm going to act as if bad things are going to, going to happen. Uh, when the alarm goes off, you know, when you're, let's say, at school, um, what happens? We think danger, we feel danger, and we act as if there's danger. We promptly leave the classroom. But sometimes what happens is the alarm is going off, we're thinking danger, we're feeling danger, but there is no fire. In essence, sometimes avoiding situations is a false alarm. We are unnecessarily leaving the situation. Helping children recognize, hey, this is, you know, this may be a false alarm. What is a real alarm versus a false alarm can be really helpful. We wanna help children recognize their thoughts, their feelings, their actions, and how they are all connected to each other. Uh, so just to give you an example here, uh, let's say you have a situation like, you know, you're walking in the hallway and somebody bumps into you. Uh, if someone bumps into you and you think to yourself, what a jerk, I can't believe he did that, you're probably going to be feeling frustrated and you may be inclined to engage in some kind of impulsive action, like to say what's wrong with you or to shove him lightly back. Uh, on the other hand, if what you were thinking in that situation is, oh, it was an accident, he should look where he's going, then you're probably going to stay calm and you might be inclined to engage in the action of inaction. In other words, you would just ignore the particular behavior. Uh, we want to help children recognize what they're thinking and feeling relates to their actions. Um, and so when children are having thoughts like, I'm so behind on my work, all the children are going to ask where I've been. Um, you know, it's really uncomfortable, you know, in the, and they're feeling it's really uncomfortable in the lunchroom. They're thinking everybody's going to be looking at me and going to laugh at me. We're not going to be as successful in getting them back to school. But if we can teach kids that they can know what are they thinking, feeling, and acting, and that if they change their action, they change their thoughts, they can in fact change how they feel and how they act, um, then we've taught them a powerful skill to help them approach their anxiety. So we have anxiety education, we have thoughts, feelings, and actions. Then we have cognitive restructuring. Cognitive restructuring is a fancy term for helping children begin to evaluate the thoughts that they're having. I often talk with children, with parents and children about how this is kind of like putting your thoughts on trial. Um, so just to give a couple of quick examples, if a child is not going to school because he's worried that all the children are going to laugh at him, or he's worried about, um, you know, the noise that the bells are make, um, we may ask him, well, how likely is it that the children are going to, uh, let's actually just stick with that example of he's worried the children are going to laugh at him. Um, how likely is it that the children are going to laugh at you? What's the evidence for it? Um, and even if it did happen that the children laughed at you when you gave an answer in class or when you said something in the lunchroom, how bad would it actually be? Um, you know, how is your worrying helping you you know, to move forward here. Is it actually constructive um, or not? So cognitive restructuring, um, which is a lot more complex, what I've given is a very quick overview here, can help children to be able to come up with alternative thoughts. 
So by challenging their thoughts, by answering these questions, they may come up with alternative thoughts like, it is really hard to go to school and school is a safe place for me to learn. It is really hard to go to school and, you know, the children don't usually laugh at me. Or it's possible that I might embarrass myself, uh, but it's really not so likely because it hasn't happened yet over the first couple of months of school when I was actually going. Um, so we have those alternative thoughts children can think of. Uh, for younger children, we often focus more on what, I, what we call coping talk. Coping talk is just kind of little nuggets of inspiration. Uh, you can do it, be brave. I know it's hard and I can do it. Uh, I'm gonna face my fear and give myself a pat on the back. Relaxation training. Relaxation training can be in the form of what's called progressive muscle relaxation, where tensing muscles and releasing muscles. Um, oftentimes with children, we'll use analogies like for squeezing, making a fist and letting go. We'll talk about how we'll imagine that you're squeezing lemons, you know, making lemonade. Great job. You got, at, you got rid of those. You squeezed out all the juice. You can put it down. Now you relax your hands. Then you can squeeze those lemons again nice and tight and you can relax. Um, we can come up with uh, different metaphors to use for each, uh, you know, each part of the body that we want to tense or relax. Um, for, uh, you know, also for the younger folks, well, often, you know, I often talk about pizza breathing, uh, which essentially is breathing in through your nose, smelling the pizza, and then breathing out through your mouth, uh, cooling off the pizza. You know, and we set it up nice and cute for them. You know, imagine you're going into the pizza shop. You know, the first thing you do is you smell your pizza and then you blow your, and then you cool off your pizza. You can have kids hold their hands in front of them like they're holding a slice of pizza. Uh, kids tend to enjoy it. Um, relaxation, though, has an asterisk next to it, which is relaxation is often problematic. Uh, and typically, I would say I don't use relaxation, though there are occasions where it can be helpful. Uh, the problem with relaxation is in order for children to really make progress, what they need to do is they need to learn to face their fears. They need to face their fear in order to recognize that nothing bad is actually, or dangerous is actually happening. And the more that they can actually be in a state of fear and experience it and live through it, the better off they're going to be. And so what that means for relaxation is that while relaxation can be helpful, it can be helpful if children are not at all engaging in a situation. If taking a few deep breaths helps them move into it, that's great. Otherwise, we probably want to try to avoid relaxation. Um, problem solving, like we touched on earlier, is what can I do or say to make the situation less fearful? Um, our final components here are going to be that when children are going to be returning to school, we'll touch on this a little bit later, uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to create some kind of fear hierarchy or a bravery mount. Uh, children are not going to just return to school if they've been out for a while. What we have to do is we have to slowly fade our way into school. Uh, this is what we refer to as gradual exposure, the practice. Um, the mountain looks a lot less daunting from halfway up. And so what we need to be doing is we need to be helping children take small steps towards fully returning to school. What I just described in terms of those series of plans has been described as helping children to build a fear plan. Fear plan is a great analogy. It was developed by a gentleman named, a psychologist named Phil Kendall uh, at Temple. Uh, and essentially feeling frightened refers to recognizing, I'm feeling anxious, what, what is my body telling me? Uh, expecting bad things to happen, those are those physiological feelings. Uh, those are those, excuse me, those are those thoughts that children are having. The attitudes and actions that can help that's the, what can I tell myself, the cognitive restructuring. That's to face my fear, I'm going to be brave. Uh, and of course, we want to review how it went and reward children um, so that they can feel good about their accomplishments. Let's talk a bit about school accommodations, uh, and then we'll wrap up talking a bit about the, uh, the family school partnership. So in terms of school accommodations, um, it's important for teachers to be educated about school refusal. Uh, oftentimes, understanding what the school refusal is about is going to really help them be sensitive and have you know, a better intuitive sense of what to do about children who are avoiding going to school. Um, teachers often have lots of good tools, um, but I think of it from it like with having a toolbox. Um, there are many great tools in a toolbox. The question, though, is which tool do you need for a particular situation? 
um, a screwdriver is not going to help you if what you're trying to do is get a nail into a wall. It's a great tool, but it's not going to help in that situation. So we want to increase developmentally appropriate labeled praise uh, in, in, in almost all situations. Um, in other words, we want to be giving positive feedback for bravery. We want to be prompting the use of coping strategies. Uh, this is just a litany of strategies again. Um, what we're trying to do here is, you know, based on our assessment, based on our understanding, we can decide which of these strategies we're going to use. Um, we may make up a break pass uh, where the child is able to go and speak with an adult, speak with a counselor. The child can call home. Um, you know, uh, you may say, well, why would I have an intervention where a child who is anxious uh, can call home? Isn't that just going to get him worked up? The answer is, you're right, it may get him worked up in some situations. For other children, it may be, well, if they go to school for a half a day and then they get to call home, that's a lot better than not going to school at all. And so what's important with these accommodations is that they are appropriately thought about and thought through for each child. Um, oftentimes when children are not going to school, we may uh, start them off on a modified schedule. Maybe they're only going to attend certain classes or maybe only certain preferred activities. Uh, other times we may have children work their way towards preferred, towards preferred activities. Um, they may be able to go to a certain class and as a result, and then they go to a club right afterwards. Um, sometimes children have certain jobs around the school. The goal is we want children who are not in school to be spending time in the building and gradually increasing the participation in events. Um, the last resort is really an alternative classroom setting, uh, you know, thinking about, you know, well, the child doesn't go to school, so we need some sort of therapeutic program. Um, it's important to note with accommodations that the accommodations are really based, like I mentioned before, on why we think kids are engaging in school behavior. And it's important to recognize that just because we make an accommodation doesn't mean that we're giving in. Uh, but also, we don't want to be too quick to give accommodations. What's important with these accommodations is that they need to be viewed as temporary. And as children progress, the accommodations need to be faded. I have a couple comments on school accommodations, and then let's wrap up. I'd love to take a few questions. Number one is, um, I'm sorry, on school family partnership. Um, so in terms of the assessment and plan creation, it's really important that this is a joint venture. Uh, whether the school's doing it, whether an outside professional is doing it, it needs to involve the family and the school. Um, once a plan is created, it's important that there is regular communication. I know that this sounds obvious. Uh, it is to some extent. At the same time, I think emphasizing it here can help folks when there are parents who are listening, when there are teachers who are listening, to be able to make a point of setting up some kind of structure that every week we're going to connect with the school. We're going to want to connect with the parents and discuss how things are going. We want to regularly review what is the plan here? What is the hierarchy? What is that list of how are we gradually getting the child back into school? Um, is he first going for the morning and then he goes home or then he's going to, you know, he's going to English and then art and then recess and then he's going home? Is he just, you know, is he gradually working his way up towards being in school more, towards being able to raise his hand? Um, the use of coping skills, progress with exposure. Um, we want to make sure that we're communicating parents to school professionals. Uh, it's really important that we avoid blaming language. Uh, it's important to recognize that there are parents who mean really well. Um, there, uh, and uh, sometimes what they are doing is seemingly enabling school behavior, school refusal behavior. Um, but at the same time, uh, usually it's not that they want to, but it's just very hard to be able to see your child in distress. Uh, and that happens with teachers as well. They're trying to be overly coddling. Uh, we don't want to be rough around the edges, but we certainly don't want to be coddling the child and enabling the child. That doesn't facilitate returning back to school. Um, and to close, uh, on a uh, formal level, uh, it can be important to have discussions with child study team members uh, and be considering 504 IEP evaluations. And then lastly, uh, sometimes schools are more equipped and sometimes schools are less equipped in terms of dealing with more entrenched school refusal behavior, uh, especially when it's co-occurring with anxiety or some other condition. Uh, and when that happens, it can be really important to be working, you know, ongoing with a private psychologist uh, who can be of assistance in 
making sure everybody is staying on the same page and in ensuring the child is progressing. Thank you very much, uh, everybody, for listening. I really appreciate your uh, time. Thank you again to NJCTS. Uh, my contact information is here if you do have uh, questions, concerns, or I could be of help to you. And um, I'm open to uh, taking questions if, uh, if we still have time for it. Uh, we do. Thank you. And I'm going to launch into one right away. We've had some, actually, some interesting questions posed. So, um, I will try my best. Okay. Um, so, first one is, um, is it appropriate for school personnel to administer the school refusal assessment scale and the, the CDI? Uh, that's a great question. Um, in terms of the technical guidelines, I'm not 100% certain. I believe with the CDI, uh, that is developed for, um, you know, for licensed psychologists or social workers. Um, you know, there is some training that can be involved in it. Uh, the school refusal assessment questionnaire, you might be more comfortable uh, administering. Um, that said, uh, I think what is, you know, the, the key take home point here is that with all of our work, we want to stay within our bounds of competence, our bounds of expertise. And so if we are learning a new skill, uh, such as administering a measure, provided that we get the proper consultation and we know, number one, how to administer it, and number two, how to properly interpret it and in what context, uh, then I think it is fine to administer. Um, so for example, um, you know, the CDI is a depression screen. Um, we don't diagnose depression. People though who are untrained may unfortunately give the questionnaire and say, oh, the child met criteria according to the questionnaire, but really that's just one component of an assessment. So I would say that it can be fine in many situations, uh, but there does need to be, um, you know, there does need to be some kind of training, you know, that you get. Okay, thank you for clarifying that. Um, we have a question about uh, individuals, kids on the um, autism, with, with autism spectrum disorder. So this has to do mm -hmm. with, uh, or, or ASD or sensory processing disorder where their emotions often are unable to be understood or the senses mm -hmm. are overwhelmed by going to school, which would be a trigger preventing yeah. them from, from attending. So could you talk about that Correct. a little bit? Sure. Um, I'm happy to comment on it. Uh, the, the real answer to your question is going to be that it depends on the child, and this is a really great example of where you need a thorough assessment. Uh, I recognize that that's probably a highly unsatisfactory answer to you. Um, in terms of working with children on the autism spectrum, uh, what we need to be again doing is pinpointing, so what exactly are the concerns? If the concerns is, are the, the, the child is overwhelmed with sensory experiences, but he is sufficiently high functioning enough to be in a regular, regular, ed, you know, regular school setting, um, then what we're going to need to be doing is making some of the targets for treatment Focused on, um, focused on teaching the child um, how to gradually get used to experiencing some of those uncomfortable sensory sensations. Uh, so for example, I've had children, uh, you know, I've had children who have a fear of the fire alarm and they don't go to school because they're worried about, they're worried about the fire alarm. Um, and so while the treatment seemingly on the surface is we need to get the child to school, in reality, the treatment is addressing that sensory component because no matter how many times we try to help the child be brave, reward the child, um, you know, for going to school, what's happening is the child is not really having any of the core fears addressed, uh, in, you know, or in this case, uh, you know, the case of your question, the child is not having any of the sensory issues addressed, which is why he's not able to properly function in school. Um, so if we are able to help the child overcome some of those sensory challenges, um, you know, then that becomes the component. And we may have to kind of, you know, take our foot off the gas in terms of pushing be back in school, be back in school. On the other hand, there are situations where the child can go back to school. Um, one would be that maybe he needs to be in a different classroom setting where there isn't as much uh, sensory activity. Um, or the other one would be, you know, as a last resort, you know, we would have to move the child into a different environment, um, you know, where, 
where some of those sensory concerns, you know, are, uh, are made irrelevant. But it's a good question and it's a challenging one to answer. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of factors that can go into it um, in terms of how high, how high functioning, low functioning the child is, what the child's skill set is, et cetera. Mm. And that would take a lot of cooperation from the school too to, to figure this out. And then implement. Correct. And, often, correct. and oftentimes when children are, um, you know, having, you know, these strong sensory reactions, uh, they're in environments where, you know, the school and the parents are cooperating. It's just a matter of figuring out the right formula. Mm -hmm. okay. But it's challenging. Um, this, I have a question that is quite actually intriguing to me. And, and but it's lengthy, so I'm I'm going to have to cut it back a little bit to find you know to be able to present it all. But basically, it, the question starts with the comments that they have a, a student in this particular school who's diagnosed of any of that, no tardies, nothing like that, no going to the nurse. So everything in school appears to be normal. Um, and, this, and, and the parent has never asked for the school's help with this school refusal situation that, she, that mm -hmm. she's witnessing at home. So, so the, the question really comes down to this. Have you, as a professional, ever dealt with the possibility of a parent demonstrating separation anxiety and or being anxious about the child being away from home, which is... Absolutely. Kind Absolutely. of an interesting and turn of events that I had never seen before. Absolutely. And, and, and um, separately, you know. can I just one more? Th can I add one more thing about that? That sure. So the school is offering a, a year at home, and um, and then or maybe a half a year at homebound, and so that's part of the question. Does that seem excessive? Got it. Um, so what I would say is, uh, you know, I'm going to try to answer this question, you know, as it was asked, but if I may, I'd like to generalize it a little bit just so that it can be useful for people who may have similar types of situations, you know, um, you know, as well. Uh, one of the common, uh, you know, one of the common indicators of anxiety in parents is when children themselves are anxious. In other words, when children are anxious, oftentimes parents are anxious. Um, so when, that may not exactly be the case here, um, but when I am doing an evaluation of a child uh, and the child is not going to school, one of the questions that I always ask is, who's, who's concerned about the, who, who is the one, you know, who kind of owns the problem here? Um, you know, this often happens as well when children are sleeping in their parents' bed, right? And I'll say when their child is nine years old and sleeps in their parents' bed, whose problem is it? You know, who, who, what's the reason the child's still in the parents' bed? Is it the child or is it the parents like sleeping with the child, uh, co-sleeping? So um, oftentimes, you know, school avoidance happens because parents are having a hard time with the situation of separating from their child. And at that point, it becomes critically important for the parents to be able to seek treatment in order to facilitate helping them cope with the anxiety of their child going to school. Because the child can actually, we run the risk of the child getting mixed messages from the parents. Parents are inadvertently communicating to the child, school is a dangerous place. Or something may happen to me, you need to be home. Um, and so uh, I, I would definitely say that that is a concern. Um, the question of home instruction is a good one and a broad question. Um, again, I cannot speak to the particular situation here, uh, but as a rule, I do not recommend home instruction. And when I do, it needs to be very carefully thought out, um, particularly because home instruction has the unintended effect of enabling school avoidance. Um, so particularly in a case where a child is fine going to school, I think that that would be important. Um, however, especially, however, especially in a case where, uh, you know, however, also in a case where a child is hesitant about going to school, I, I wouldn't want to do that. Um, a similar issue with home instruction comes up when kids are in great distress and often today we have working parents and a parent says to me, 
you know, I'm really thinking that I should take a leave of absence from my job. I just don't know how to deal with my child. I do everything in my power, again, this is generally speaking, to encourage that parent not to take a leave of absence from their job. The minute that parent is home, it will be that much harder to get the child to school. So I think that touches on your question. If there's follow-up, I'm happy to take okay, it. Okay, but what, what would you, how, how would you suggest that the school handle this situation then? I mean, they've offered this home instruction time so they're they're doing what they oh. think is you know the best approach. Is there some some other thing here you see for the school to do? Oh, meaning the child is not meaning if the situation is that the child is not actually coming to school, um, I'm not well, sure what else the school can do if the child is not coming to school. Um, I would be more inclined, but again, I, I would need details to give a real clinical recommendation, um, which I obviously am not going to get here on the phone. Um, I would be more inclined to be pushing the school in a direction that gets the, you have to probably do some home instruction. We don't want the parent's pathology to interfere with the child's ability to get an education. Mm -hmm. So they may not really have a choice but to offer home instruction. Um, at the same time, uh, I think it'd be really important uh, to lay the parameters clear that this is not the that the parent is not living up to their end of the deal in terms of getting their child to school, and to be in a clinically sensitive way, uh, ensuring that the parent is taking the appropriate steps so that that parent gets into treatment, uh, mm -hmm. because the research on school refusal is just so conclusive that not being in school is generally not good. Okay. This is a little bit different because the child is fine with school, um, it but it is seem. really important. Yeah. Okay, all right, thank you, thank you. Um, so, how can the school or the parent get the child out of the car if they've driven them to school and they refuse? Is there a point at which you sit in the parking lot for 10 minutes and then go back home again or just, you know, try the library first, or what's the best approach? Um, this definitely varies by age. Uh, with the younger folks, it is much easier. Uh, and in that situation, you simply bring the child to school, you walk him or her into the door, and then, you know, you have a, uh, you know, you have a, um, you know, a counselor or somebody who is, you know, comfortable within the situation. There are often regulations in school, essentially, you know, you're kind of passing off the child. Um, that's perfectly okay in situations, provided that that is the appropriate intervention. This is a good example of that is a tool in your toolbox, but it may not be for kids. You don't need to bother with that. It's not feasible to just bring the child to school. Um, when children are completely refusing to go in, often what I'm thinking about is we need to break things down into parts. Uh, and as uh, as parents, as, as school staff, we're saying, well, how much more, how much more can I break down going to school? <laughs> you know, all we're doing is going to the parking lot. Mm -hmm. And so the answer would be that we need, you know, this is where our fear hierarchy needs to begin with items such as, uh, you know, going to the parking lot on a Sunday and just sitting in the car, standing outside, walking around the grounds with mom or a parent, you know, who you're comfortable with. Uh, going to school, um, you know, after hours, and maybe there's a guidance counselor who's still there who can just meet the child and talk to them outside the building for two minutes, um, or a teacher. Um, then going during school hours, not during the drop-off and pick-up time when there's hustle and bustle, and walking and standing out, you know, you're really gradually, you're taking very small steps um, towards going into school. Mm -hmm. okay. So you can hand off, but sometimes that's an indicator that we need to take a step back. All right. Um, there's a question here about um, PTSD. And uh, so the question is, what if parents kind of feed the avoidance by labeling it as PTSD, but allow socialization with friends outside school? It's interesting because, you know, with everything that happens in schools these days, unfortunately, I could understand PTSD a little bit being an issue for some kids, but this 
potentially um, is, a, is another situation. Um, so I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. Sure. Um, I'd like to answer your question and also answer a different question that wasn't asked but that I didn't touch on and think is really important. Um, if parents are feeding avoidance, this comes down to parent education. Um, this is why uh, you know, I may spend two or three sessions talking with families about what I'm, what we're going to do rather than just jumping into treatment. Because if parents don't understand the rationale for treatment and how certain behaviors they're doing will be moving them in the right direction and certain behaviors they're doing, however well intentioned, move them in the wrong direction, um, you're not going to be successful. Parents feeding, quote unquote, you know, that their child has trauma and shouldn't be going to school is not a good reason for the child not to go to school. It's a good reason for the parents to, um, you know, to, uh, you know, to seek resources to help them appropriately, you know, help their child go to school. On the other hand, um, one of the things we didn't cover is sometimes children don't go to school, not even sometimes, often it is the case that children aren't going to school because of problems that happen in school. For example, children may be fearful of going to school because they are being teased or bullied. Um, the solution there is not to be pushing the child to school. Uh, in those situations, there needs to be a careful, um, you know, schools typically have protocols about this, and the, the issue with the bullying needs to be addressed. It could actually be counterproductive for a child who is being severely bullied to continue to endure the bullying. Um, you know, in a perfect world, the way I believe it should work, um, you know, but I'm not a school administrator, uh, would be that the child who is bullying should be, you know, that process should be expedited and that child should be removed. Uh, but unfortunately, sometimes, uh, even with schools that are really well equipped, uh, bullying is very sneaky and it's very hard to stop. Uh, and sometimes once the damage is done, it's very hard to undo. Um, and so it's really tricky. Uh, but, you know, when a child actually has been traumatized with school, uh, that needs to be carefully evaluated. When a child is avoiding school as a result of a problematic situation, um, we don't just want to put the child back into school. We need to carefully fade him back in, ensuring that it is, in fact, a safe environment. Hmm. Okay. We've gone over a little bit. I'm, I have one more question, and then we're going to um, to wrap it up there, okay? Um, sure. It, it would seem to this person with the question, and I, I have to agree, it kind of seems that way to me too, that why does there seem to be a rise in school avoidance and school refusal? Um, does it seem that way to you that we're seeing more of it? Maybe it's getting diagnosed differently or, or diagnosed better, or it's a real thing that um, there's more of it. I'm not sure. Um, there definitely is an increase in education. Um, and there also is a change in the way, you know, kids are in every, in every generation. Um, I often hear from parents in my practice, like when I'm dealing with behavior management and listening and compliance and things like that. Well, you know, if I would, I would just never have said something like that. I think we're going to end it here. Thank you very much. That was great. We do have questions left, and Kelly will explain how those will be handled. And uh, that was a great presentation. For refusal, there is an exit survey, which we need every seven days on the NJCTS website for any additional questions that were not covered in tonight's presentation. Those questions that were posted that we did not get to answer we will post up to the to that blog and have Dr. Flankbaum, I'm sorry, Dr. Flansbaum answer that question. That website is www.njcts.org. Also, an archived recording of tonight's webinar will be posted to our website. Our next presentation, bullying. What a parent can do if their child is a bully or a victim um, will be presented by Beth Means and is scheduled for October 23rd, 2019. This ends tonight's webinar.
Thank you, Dr. Flansbaum, for your presentation, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Good night.